Much better. Much better. Yeah. Um, so, hello. First of all, welcome to the 14th annual Prince William County Mental Health Awareness Event. And our purpose for this event is to bring together the mental health community with the community at large to educate, inspire, and dispel myths about mental illness. So next I'd like to take a few minutes uh, to take care of some housekeeping details. Uh, please take a moment to silence your phones and other electronics. And uh, then another important piece of information, of course, the restrooms are located uh, across from the auditorium entrance. And please note there are four exits. There are two at the rear and two additional ones up front here. In the event of a fire alarm, please walk out the closest exit and assemble in the parking lot at least 100 feet from the building. In the event of a tornado warning, uh, this auditorium is actually the safest place to be, so please stay here until the warning is lifted. And then please do join us for a barbecue dinner afterwards out in the atrium. And uh, now I'd like you to please help me welcome Prince William County Community Services Executive Director, Lisa Madron, to the stage. Good evening. And on behalf of Community Services, I'd like to welcome you to the 14th Annual Mental Health and Mental Awareness event. Thank you for being here. And I'd like to especially thank our Mental Health Awareness Committee, those from Trillium Drop-In Center, from Axe, from NAMI Prince William, and of course, Community Services, and all of the participants who planned and dedicated their time and energy and creativity to making this afternoon and evening very special. I'm very excited about hearing our speaker tonight not only because Dr. Davis was on the Board of Community Services for many years and is quite um, skilled on mental health issues and needs, but because of the topic tonight, <coughs> resilience and opportunity to grow, which I wholeheartedly believe in. Coincidentally, in July, Community Services embarked on what I hope to be the first of a series of collaborations and training in building a culture of individual and community resilience. And there will be more to come on that. But this evening, I invite you to learn and to grow and to connect, and I wish you resilience. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa Mason. And our speaker today is Dr. Molly Davis, and she's going to speak about resilience. Dr. Molly Everett Davis is Associate Professor in the Department of Social Work. Davis's research interests are diverse and include gerontology and geriatrics, trauma across the life course, disaster behavioral health and cultural competence models. She's the developer of the LifeWays model, a model which is used to train professionals to promote increased <coughs> cultural competence she has been an innovator in developing models to integrate our understanding of trauma with special populations such as older adults, disaster behavioral health, faculty of color in academia, and child welfare. She is presented frequently on her own trauma transformation model. Dr. Davis has coordinated social work in the Mason and Partners Clinic, MAP, which serves as a training site for students from social work and multiple health disciplines within the College of Health and Human Services. This integrated care setting has provided an interprofessional learning opportunity for primary health and behavioral health disciplines. Before working at Mason, Davis had experience as a clinical social worker in mental health settings and as an associate professor in a university in Florida. So please welcome Dr. Molly Davis to the stage.
everyone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. Is it, is it okay? Yeah. Okay. I'm so thrilled to be here today, and um, I am going to try to turn my message into one that has meaning for each of us. Um, I think the essence of what I'm going to be talking about here today is something that we all can apply in our lives. Um, on the journey that I'm going to take you to help you understand why this works and what the thinking is behind it, it may be boring. Hopefully not. So one of the things I've done is intersperse some little pictures to keep things lighthearted. Because when you talk about some of the issues around trauma and the reasons why people need particular help um, to deal with issues in their lives, it's not always happy. But I do want you to uh, see that I am very optimistic about what I'm going to be talking about today. And I think that it, hopefully, it will be helpful to you. Okay, so. So when we think about our lives, we need to really think about it from a life course perspective. Okay, great. Thank you. We need to think about our whole lives because if you if you divide your life into just periods of time, it doesn't make sense because we have a whole life. And so it matters what happened when we were born, when we were children. And it matters throughout your life, even into old age. And one of the things that I often point out um, when there's discussions about the ACE, which is really a research study that was done showing the significance of early childhood trauma um, in the life of individuals, that research was done with older adults. Um, so I hear it all the time in the context of children, but it really was done with older adults who were looking back at their early lives. Um, and so I think it's important to have a life course perspective because the things that happen in your life are all important. Um, and if I am going to tell my story, I'm going to tell you from the beginning to where I am. So I always take a life course perspective and it's very important. Let me say a few things about um, trauma. And again, I. Uh, this is a definition of trauma, not a big deal. The, the bottom line is, is that we have come to understand that <coughs> trauma is really about the, the life events that occur in your, in your life. Um, and the more and more, the, the later the research, the more we understand that trauma is not unusual. We all have experienced it. That the death of a pet, a divorce, um, uh, first day of school that went badly, being bullied, all of those things represent potential traumatic life events. So when we look at it from that perspective, we're saying that because you have had a quote traumatic experience, that doesn't make you unusual. That makes you normal. We all have had these traumatic events and experiences in our lives. And so I think that the definitions that we're seeing now pivot more around those issues. So it depends on what happened to you. You know, when you were six years old, the house burned down. Then that's an important traumatic event for you. Uh, if I haven't experienced that, then I'm not going to be uh, concerned about that in the way in which you would be concerned about it. So we really have to know the story of individuals in order to understand um, the, the kinds of thoughts, feelings, and experiences that they have. So I'm going to move on from that definition. Um, I'm going to move pretty quickly through here, but I promise you I'm not going to, um, it's not going to be as complicated as it probably looks. Um, all right, so trauma and mental health. The idea that trauma is pretty much viewed as a catalyst for most mental health issues. Um, and I don't think we've come to the full realization of that. But I think it is. Um, and so when we look at 
how do we address the issues, uh, it's important that we think about the fact, what is the root issue? Uh, and to go back and look at the things that happened to us. Again, knowing our story is very important uh, and being able to obtain that uh, from um, us. Okay, so where are we in, on the, the journey? So I showed you a road with a journey. And so our lives are like a journey, like, like a road that, that goes uh, around and up and down and all those kinds of things. So I wanted to just share with you some of the latest information that I have been able to collect on how we're doing in terms of mental health issues. Let me warn you, that's not so great. But I promise you, I will summarize in one sentence what the chart shows, all right? So you don't have to uh, worry about looking at the data uh, in any detail. Um, okay, so there are a couple of surprises there. So this is a survey that SAMHSA does, which is the Substance Abuse Mental Health Administration, Services Administration. Uh, so this data comes from them. This chart says that treatment, st treatment gaps still exist. There are certain groups of, of, of clients who, who receive treatment. And there are other groups they don't receive much. And the smallest group down here um, it represents major <laughs> depressive episodes. So that means that in the whole realm of services offered uh, for clients who have a mental illness or a mental disorder, um, that category is not being served uh, in comparison to uh, substance abuse or even serious mental illness. All right, so that, that's the summary of that one. The next slide shows us that we still have young adults at a, at a serious level who are thinking about suicide. Um, and that they may be outside? Suicide. Okay. Okay. So the bottom line is here is that we still have folks, a fairly large number, who have suicidal thinking and action bottom line on that again, which is not great. All right, and then the next chart is one that represents the fact that we're seeing more major depressive episodes among young adults, right? The next slide looks at, this was kind of a shock to me, it looks at daily or almost daily use of marijuana by pregnant women. And I thought we kind of gotten past that. Um, but this data indicates that pregnant women are using marijuana, which, you know, the message is virtually you don't use anything if you're pregnant uh, because most things can impact the, the uh, infant. And there is no evidence that indicates that this may not, this will not hurt uh, an unborn child. In fact, there's some evidence countering that. So this says that pregnant women are using marijuana uh, daily, or almost daily. It's, it's not good news. Substance use in the past month among pregnant women. Again, I was surprised at that. Um, but this also covers not only marijuana, but also illicit drugs like street drugs, uh, tobacco, and alcohol. So I'm not quite sure how we have, you know, in the years past, we, we did these massive campaigns, and we, the message was pretty, uh, pretty strong to the community that pregnant women should not use drugs. Uh, that didn't mean that everybody stopped, but the message was pretty, pretty clear. But what we have now is a pattern where they are using a drug, and that's concerning. The next slide says the marijuana use among young adults has significant increases in women. So we see something going on with women. I think we're seeing a pattern of increased drug use, period, with women. And that is also included uh, if they were pregnant as well. And um, that's, that's not a good 
good sign. That's not what we want to really see. The next slide looks at folks who initiate using alcohol. And that largest column on the end represents 12 to 17 year olds. Okay, so we know alcohol can be a really dangerous drug. And now we have more 12 to 17 year olds initiating the use of alcohol than young adults. So something's going wrong there as well. And then my last slide here shows that um, mental health and substance abuse disorders um, in the United States, they are seeing increases. Okay? So I, I watched the director of SAMHSA give this presentation on YouTube, and she concluded her presentation saying something I think is very important. Uh, and she said, people think that marijuana is harmless. And that is not true. She said, the data they, they have gotten and collected shows that it is more harmful than alcohol. So sometimes the community beliefs and perceptions don't exactly jive with the facts. And so I was glad she was honest and came out and said that because um, even though there are many cities and increasingly states who are making it legal, that doesn't mean that it's not harmful. So that data was uh, somewhat shocking. Um, I'm simply sharing this so that you know kind of what's going on because this is our country, these are our communities, and so we're all involved in this. This is not the finger point anywhere, but we need to be aware of some things. Um, this next slide, uh, come from the uh, Mental Health of America uh, site. Um, here again, you keep seeing increases. So here, this data shows you over 10.3 million adults have serious thoughts of suicide. So that, of course, is a concern whenever it occurs. Um, more than 10 million adults have an unmet need for mental health treatment. So again, we're kind of behind in the treatment as well. We're, we're not able to keep up with the demand. Um, over 70% of youth with major depression are still in need of treatment. So again, that's that group that wasn't getting uh, much treatment. So this is all useful, helpful to really look at how we are strategic in the way in which we try to deal with these issues. Major depression in youth has increased 4.3% over the last six years. Uh, so now over 2 million youth have depression with severe impairment. Where's that depression coming from? What is going on there? That should be the question that we're all um, looking to answer. So I'm going to share with you my um, own kind of approach, uh, which is called um, Think Again. And um, it looks at the power of thinking and rethinking. It looks like it's pretty simple, and I try to sell it on that basis, think again. But it is powerful, and it, and it is supported by a lot of research, uh, um, and also brain research, uh, biochemical. Uh, it is very, very supported in the research. But the bottom line is, think again. So I'm going to talk you through this, and first we're going to see our first baby shot. OK, this is good news, right? <laughs> Think again, that means that there's something that we can do to address some of the things that may be um, somewhere involved in what we're seeing in this data. So I always start out, you ever heard me speak, you heard me talk about uh, this woman. So I interviewed her when she was 108 years old. And um, she, when she died, she was 100 and I think 14. She was the, at the time, she was the oldest African American in the country. And so I had the privilege of interviewing her, and um, she was, you know, perfectly fine. She was in a nursing home because she needed the supervision, but she was really doing quite well. And so I asked about a, a, a number of different things, and you can see there from some of the comments that she was a pretty positive thinker. Uh, she always thought there would be a next year, or when you're 113 or 14, uh, that's pretty optimistic, don't you think? Okay, well, she was. Um, she kind of generally had a positive um, attitude. Um, she believed that she could 
handle anything. Okay, all right. Um, and she didn't let things upset her. She just didn't. And so I asked her during that interview um, about her experience of discrimination in America because her grandparents were slaves when she was very old. So she was born in the 1800s. Um, and so, um, and her parents, I think, was the, the first generation out of slavery. And so she had some exposure to that. And I asked her about discrimination in her life. Again, looking at the life story, looking at the, the, the story that people have. Um, and she, she looked at me and she said, I don't think I've experienced discrimination. I was like, oh my goodness, this is not possible. It's not possible. How is it possible? And so uh, I, I just, I didn't have much to I mean, say after that, I couldn't say, oh, well, you had to have, because I know historically there was plenty of discrimination, uh, legally and otherwise. Um, so, so I said, well, how, how could that be? And she said, well, I, I learned when I was a little girl that if you're kind to other people, they're kind to you. And I have found in my life that when I'm kind to other people, they're kind to me. So that began my journey, because I thought, could a person's thinking have that much power to bring kind of a sense of life satisfaction, even through difficult times? Um, and she was pretty healthy for 108 at the time I, I interviewed her. So I thought, well, that must be working pretty well, too. So she really was the first one that opened my eyes up to, there must be something here. There's something here about being able to think positively about your life and your experiences. So then I started looking around. Now this is a gentleman who is 101 years old, and he just finished his ninth marathon. Don't be shameful about this, I mean it's 101. <laughs> And um, so he's obviously doing very well. So the other part of his story is that he was highly depressed because um, his son had died and um, he apparently witnessed that, so that's trauma. Um, and so he was depressed for some time. But then when he was 89 years old, he decided that he wanted to come out of that depression and he wanted a reason to live. So he started running. Isn't that amazing? Now I can tell you too that he's not depressed anymore. Okay? He's not depressed anymore. So there's something there that, you know, is very intriguing to me to understand. Um, I understand depression when you've lost a loved one, but somehow, through his thinking and his action, he was able to overcome that. Um, and then there's a story of a 109-year-old Holocaust survivor. Now, you know what the Holocaust survivor event was, historically. Uh, it was a highly trauma traumatizing event uh, that we hope that no one else has to ever go through that. Um, but when asked about her life and how she lived to be 109, she says, well, look for the beauty in life. Um, that her solution for feeling good at her age was that just an optimism and looking for the good. Okay, so now I'm seeing some validation of what I saw with Ms. Wynn. Somehow this positive attitude or this way of thinking uh, has the power to do some pretty phenomenal kinds of things. So then, um, these are some of the other messages that come from people who are over 100 years. Oh, and what do you notice about that? Life is beautiful. Do the best you can. Uh, you're not perfect. That was, that was my clue there. You're not perfect, but just do the best you can. Do what you need to do, not always what you want to do. Listen to the heart and do what is right. Opportunities are everywhere. Take them and follow through. Do you hear the positive optimism in those statements? Yeah. 
So I'm hearing again and again, it's something about this, something about this is important to survival, and something is there is important in how you live your life. Um, she's 113, she says, in life there are always problems. You, you solve your problems the best way you can and accept the rest. Say this kind of thinking about, you know, I'm not gonna stress out, I'm going to, I'm gonna figure out how to deal with this and, and go on. And, and that's what I see, seen, I've seen all, you know, over and over. She's 105. I think peace is more like happiness. Having peace in your heart, not holding any grudge against anyone, forgive and you will be forgiven. Okay. All right. Seems really simple, right? Okay. So let me ask you a question. And uh, I want you to raise your hand if this applies to you. Do you love life? Good. Good. Great. Great. I asked my class the other day um, of about 21 students. I think three hands went up. And I was really shocked. You know, they're in college and, you know, generally, there's some older ones in there, but generally younger. And, you know, I was surprised. I was like, what is wrong with you all? Um, they didn't raise their hands. Um, I'm not sure about that. So anyway, so do you think that life is easy? Hands up if you think it's easy. Wow. Uh, oh, one. <laughs> okay. One. All right. So it's interesting. Okay. Would you say that your physical health is good? Okay. Probably about a fourth of you. Okay. Now. I just have to tell you this anecdotally. Um, one of my students in my class wrote that he had, um, had had another professor that told them that if you believe that your health is good, your health will be good. Now, I'm a positive thinker, you know, with this, I'm already thinking that way, but that sounded lunatic to me, really. I mean, I could, I could think about it from multiple pathways, well, with this and that, and all that, that, that. But just to make a blanket student, the student just made a blanket statement that if you think your health is good, then your health will be good. Okay, so then I did go and research where he got that from. Um, and he actually did get it from someone who uh, believes that she actually used a study, and I do say a study, which is a red flag. Um, and the, in that study, they asked people if they thought their health was good. And then after eight years, they went back and looked at death records. And they found that um, most of the people who said their health was not good uh, were dead in a, a, a significant percent. Um, so there's a variety of different explanations for that, I, I think. And so I, I would, you know, I caution the student, I wouldn't just go out and, and say, say this. Uh, although I'm the first one to say that it does matter what you believe. It absolutely does matter, and that is part of what I think, again, it's about. It does matter. All right. Is your stress level very high? Hands up. Okay. Maybe about a third. Um, is your stress level low or non-existent? Okay. About five or six. Okay. All right. Good. Um, do you expect to die before you are 80 years old? Okay, all right, probably about 12, 12 to 15, okay? So, thinking is very important. Um, and so, you'll see why I think so, uh, sure. Okay, here's my animal thing. This is really interesting, I wonder what it is. Okay, all right, so, actually she, the person who um, said that about if you think your health is good, whatever, is this person. Um, and so her conclusion is that don't have a negative attitude about stress or you will die earlier. 
Okay, that was her conclusion. My conclusion is what you believe will impact your body, health status, and longevity. And that's what I've seen um, with the folks who are 100. So I agree with that bottom statement. I'm not quite sure I agree with her. So then, we've been talking about resilience. This conference is about resilience. What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about the ability to kind of adapt well in the face of challenges. We all have challenges in our lives. Um, and how we adapt to those, how, how we figure out how we're going to get through those challenges is what resilience uh, involves. We are not born resilient. Um, we learn to be resilient, and there are certain things that we look at in terms of how we um, develop in our ability to do resilience. So I'm going to show you a couple of things. So do you think that thinking can change your life? Your thinking can change your life. OK? Good. It can? Absolutely. So that is the basis of Think Again. And I'm going to talk to you about as well about some of the, the research, brain research. But I first wanted to tell you about him. Looks like a, a nice guy, right? Uh, he's a NASA rocket scientist. And he's an engineer. Uh, his name is Dr. Terry Morris. Um, I invited him to uh, George Mason and campus, and uh, he came and he told his story. Um, Terry has one of the worst um, child maltreatment experiences that I've ever heard. Uh, it was hard to believe uh, when he told his story. From the age of four, when he misbehaved, his parents would put him out of the house. He was four years old. And the, they would put him out for, on the average, anywhere between two to three weeks. And he would be on his own in the streets in Chicago. Okay. Um, and so Terry learned how to survive on the streets of Chicago with the homeless. He had rats as companions. Um, he learned to survive. Do you think that's a characteristic of resilience? It is, it is. All right, so he was horribly mistreated. He was um, singled out. He had sisters and brothers. They did not, they were not mistreated. He was the only one, and his mom told him because they had, some of them had different daddies, and his mom said, I can't stand your dad, and you look like him. So he was singled out because of his father. And he sustained physical abuse, sexual abuse. Of course, a four-year-old child is very vulnerable. He has a scar now on his head where they hit his head against the radiator um, as one of the forms of punishment that they did. So when he was 13 years old, they put him in the car with them and they drove him to Mississippi, and they told him, get out. He did not know anybody in Mississippi. They just simply drove him from Chicago to Mississippi and made him get out of the car. So he survived for a while, sleeping under people's porches. He talks about snakes being under there and that kind of thing. And then uh, finally, somebody reported him to CPS that they had seen this child, you know. And so he was put in a boy's home then, a boy's group home. And that was really the first time that he could consistently go to school because he wasn't able to really go to school consistently in uh, Chicago because they would not give him the proper shoes and clothes and things that he needed. Um, so when he got a chance to go to school regularly and had the opportunity to be in the same space uh, and to have meals, which he did not consistently have, uh, he began to thrive. He was extremely smart. He said everything he tried, he went, he excelled in it. Whether it was running track, whether in his, all his classes he made A's, 
whatever. And uh, he's just a gifted person. And so they recognized NASA recruited him from high school uh, because of his intellect. And um, so he has, uh, he's gotten his PhD and he works at NASA. Okay. So when I heard his story, I was thinking, that's the worst story I think I've ever heard. Uh, but also, the best example of how you can survive, how you can thrive, even though there's been bad things in your life. I can't think about a four-year-old out fitting for himself in Chicago for weeks. But as bad as his situation is, he is healthy, he is strong, he has a family. He goes around and he tells his story. That's pretty much his therapy. He tells his story, um, and when he goes around to speak, he pays his own way. Uh, but that's part of how he's given back, because he was able to get through a situation like that. So there are people who have difficult experiences in their life, but it is possible to rebound. It's possible to be, develop resilience. It doesn't always have to be downhill. The think again model is simply the idea that you can transform trauma. Now, trauma happens because it's linked to the experiences that happen in our lives, but it doesn't have to remain untouched. It can be transformed, and so the Think Again model is one strategy to kind of move away from that trauma experience in a fairly simple way. It has to do with how your brain is designed to work and the connection between the brain and the body. And that is why it can work. Holocaust survivors. Um, this is just one person, but you, again, you see the same thing. Uh, when they were talking, the researchers were talking to this person about how they survived when their whole family, everybody else was killed. She said, I was very strong in my belief that we will survive. Her belief, her thinking uh, is really important. I knew that I had to survive. I had a mission to survive, okay? So her thinking propelled her through a difficult situation, and you know what happened um, with, under the, the Nazis. So again, we hear this positive kind of thing. So um, it is important that we understand that um, early childhood experiences are important, and what the research shows is that it can impact your whole life not just your childhood, but your whole life. But there are things that we can do to still get past that. It's like with Terry. Uh, he had a bad early childhood experience, but he's successful now, and he's doing well, and that's something that we all can do. Um, that when we talk about resilience, we're talking about surviving by wits. That was something some of the Holocaust survivors talked about, is that they just figured out things. They would go and steal food from here, but whatever, <coughs> survival was the main thing, and they were able to figure that out. So that, that is very important in resilience. Also, one of the things that's, that's surfacing in the research too is around forgiveness. That there are bad things that happen in our lives, but we hurt ourselves more through unforgiveness than forgiving them, because it keeps us stuck. So they talk about the role of forgiveness, and they talk about one particular, well actually a couple of people, um, one woman who said, I will never, ever, ever stop hating um, the situation that happened to me. I'll never forget it, I'll never get over it. And she did not, and she had a rotten life. She wasn't happy, she was depressed, etc. Then there was another woman who said, that was a bad thing that happened to us. You know, I lost my family too, but I am not going to give, um, Hitler the satisfaction of destroying the rest of my life. I'm going to be normal, I'm going to have children, I'm going to do well, and guess what? She did that. What's the difference? Thinking, what you think about that. Um, and so here again, we keep seeing this message that we really, thinking is very powerful. Then, um, 
Then we're going to look just briefly, and I'm going to go quickly here, uh, through the brain research. The brain helps us to relabel experiences. Um, I have an image in here as well, but you know, we, uh, in the Bahamas, it just went through the hurricane. Um, but we've seen other disasters too. The fires in California, there's disasters uh, quite frequently. But have you ever watched people as they're being interviewed on television after that? Let's say the fires in California. They had, many of the people had 10 minutes to get out. And so, they lost mostly everything, the house, everything was gone. And they talked to some people and some of them were saying, uh, I want to die. I lost everything, all my pictures, all my memories, everything was important to me, it's gone. And they're depressed and they don't want to live. They talked to other people who experienced the same thing and they said, well, we're gonna build a game, you know? We're going to build again. We're not going to let this stop them. What's the difference? The thinking. It is the thinking that makes the difference. Um, and that thinking can go even to the next level of, I didn't like that house anyway. <laughs> so, you know, it's just thinking, figuring out how to think positively. Um, so when, you're, when you experience a traumatic event, it is a combination of your emotional signals going on in your body, but also your thinking. Um, and so it matters how you think about it. When people experience very similar kinds of things, it's how they think about it. The Terry, the way he thought about his life, I asked him specifically about, um, how did you do so well in school? And he said, because the other kids were moving around, but he said, I have learned from my experience that this was a chance that I needed to take. I was going to be really serious. He, he knew the other side, the consequences, if he didn't do well. And so that motivated him. But I could not have known that about his thinking except that he told me that. So I'm saying that to you, particularly those of you who are um, a therapist or uh, professionals in the human services, is that it is so critical to understand the thinking of the people we work with. And we can understand through our communication with them when we hear their story, because they tell us. They tell us about resilience. The seeds of resilience are there, but you, you have to get it from them, and you only know that when you learn who they are. And I, I'll say more about that a little later. Um, so what the, the brain research tells us is that your choices change your brain. When you say, I'm not going to be, I, I broke up with my boyfriend or girlfriend and I'm really down. And then you decide, I'm not going to be down. I'm going to move on. I, I'm not going let, to let this destroy me. Okay? That change of brain can change your, can, your change, that change of your thinking changes your brain. That is the way we are wired, that our thinking has a direct impact on our brain. And again, this is validated with a lot of research. Not only our brain, but also our bodies. The research clearly de declares that we, change, we can change the biochemistry of our body through our thinking. That is the way we're created. And so when we looked at that, that data from the ACE study, where it says, okay, so you have early childhood trauma like Terry did, um, then that is associated with the major illnesses that we have in old age. So you have early childhood trauma and then you get cancer, you get diabetes, you get heart, heart disease. The research shows there's a connection there. So that trauma experience is translated into making you sick. So I want you to see as well that the way you think can impact your health status. And again, the most exciting thing here is that we get to choose. We can choose how we think. And sometimes it involves really just when we're not ah, feeling the or whatever, you need to stop and ask yourself, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? 
And if uh, negative thoughts come in, I can't do anything, well, no matter what I do, I can't succeed. You need to stop it. Stop it. Just stop it. Change it. You can do it just like that. You can change it. No, no, I'm not going to think that way. I'm going to think that way. That's what I heard the people over 100 tell me they did. They refused to, to go down that path of negative thinking and because it would hurt them. And so they could feel good about themselves by changing the way they think. So it is very important that we recognize that something that simple can actually bring about changes in the brain and in your body. Uh, and there's a lot of, of evidence to support that. Neuroplasticity is just a big term that says that your brain changes. You know, people used to think, well, you know, whatever you are, you are. No, it changes, but it changes in response to your thinking and to the experiences that you have in life. So that, uh, that is why it does so much damage to children because they're developing. It really just kind of wires itself around the child and that child's experiences. And if that child is being abused, it develops a brain that is sensitive to, uh, to trauma. So they're afraid a lot of times, they, they, their emotions are out of control. All of those things is because that brain trained and, and configured itself around that experience of being afraid, of never knowing when they're going to uh, be hurt again. The mind, this is very important, this is the way, this comes from brain researchers. Our ability to think and choose what we think shapes our mind. We control our brain through our thinking and choosing. And the mind is designed to control the body. So the brain is a part of the body. Your mind controls your body. That's why we see this ongoing connection between physical illnesses or the, the, uh, in your body and ways of thinking. And it is present in a lot of different pools of research, even um, in terms of uh, spirituality. You know, they do research on folks who had surgery, and it doesn't matter what belief system they have, but if they have some kind of belief system that gives them meaning to life, they recover quicker. There are lots of different uh, pieces of research that tells you that something is going on in the way that we think um, and manage. The other part, which is also, I think is probably newer, but it's a very clear evidence of developing, it has a, a potential to impact your DNA. That is really important because that means that you can transmit across generations certain patterns. So when your life changes because of the thinking and because of what's going on in your body, you also can begin the process of impacting the next generation. This becomes very important when you look at child welfare and you look at children being mis uh, uh, maltreated, but their parents, also have also been maltreated. And so you have something going there that is uh, genetic, which is something that, uh, again, is something we should be really concerned about. Um, we choose, this choice issue is very important, we choose how we focus our attention. We can focus on anything we want to. That is a capability that our brains have. have. Um, and that is our free will. So I'm gonna show you this image. This is an image of one of the islands after Dory. What do you think when you see that? What are, you, what are you thinking and what do you pay attention to? What's the first thing you pay attention to on this photo? That's gonna be different, we all pay attention to different things. Who, who paid attention to that middle, big house sitting in the middle there? Well, what probably what's left of it. Hands? Okay, that was your focal point, okay. How many of you kind of more or less paying attention to all this other rubble around that house? Okay, all right. Okay, so that's, that is an example of how we can choose to focus our attention where we, we want to. So that we can focus on things that are positive, we can, think, we can focus on things that are negative. That's our choice. And so what we're saying is that when you choose to focus on something that is positive, that is better for you than to think to focus on something that's negative. 
again, like the two women, one says, I'm, not, I'm just not going to ever get any better. My life is at an end. Well, that's what they, that person chooses to focus on. But you have choice. You can choose to think positively. And I hope that as a result of this presentation, that each of us will begin to really look at what are we thinking and to choose to think something more positive. Okay? Uh, it's our choice. I'm telling you, it will, it will help your brain and it will help your body. If you have to choose between thinking negatively and thinking positively, think positive, uh, definitely. And we have the ability to rethink. That means that even when we're thinking negatively, we can think again. That's, that is why I named it, think again. You can think again. Hmm, can you find something positive in this? Well, you know, we see this a lot of times in older adults, um, where we begin to think about, okay, we have to figure out what is my life, what's the meaning of my life. You may look back at a whole life of rotten things, but can you say anything positive about that? I survived, okay? That, is that positive? Yeah, yeah. Or you could choose to, you know, pay, put, pay attention to all the things you could have, should have done. I thought I would be the president of the United States by the time I was 30, and that didn't happen, and on and on and on. I guarantee you, you will be depressed. Negative thinking will push you into depression, and it sends bad signals into your body. So to choose to always look to focus on the good and to change your thinking and make that a habit, it will take initially, it will take you really thinking about it. Okay, uh, I'm thinking negative. I need, I need to find something positive. It will initially take you to practice that, but if you begin to practice this, this is what I saw with the centenarians, it became a lifestyle. A lifestyle of looking at things from a different perspective than how it actually looked. And that's why Mrs. Wynn could tell me she didn't think she had experienced discrimination because she wasn't paying attention to it. She changed her focus and she was able not to be bitter and whatever else goes along with that. And so it's important. Okay, look at this picture. What, where's your attention? How many of you focus on the woman? Okay, how many focus in on pretty much her face? Okay, it's on, okay. How many of you focus on what's going on around her? Okay, all right. So you can see, we have this ability to have multiple perspectives. We're not locked into one. So just as easily as some of you looked at this, paid attention to that or whatever, that's how we can shift our focus. Um, and it's important. We cannot control the events or circumstances of our life, but we can control our reaction. We can choose how we react. And so I'm saying to you, for the sake of your brain, um, choose to react differently. Okay, so I say this, uh, we, we need to become our own brain surgeon. There are certain thoughts we need to just cut out. We can do it, you know. I'm not, I'm not gonna think that. I'm gonna think this instead. And that's very important. One of the techniques and, uh, that you can use is if you use, and this is what the brain researchers say, five to 15 minutes a day on focused, meditated thought. Again, focus. Um, deep thinking increases the incidence of a happier outlook. So how many of you do any kind of meditation? Okay, good for you. And the rest of us need to make sure we do that as well. Um, I uh, am training my students in that every time they come to class, I have them go through meditation at the beginning of it. Um, and they're telling me that how they begin to integrate that into their everyday life. That's what you want to do. You want to make it a habit so that you do this. Now, there's some things that work against it. I'm, I'm out of my time, uh, so I'm going to go really quick. Um, there's some things about our lives that work against that um, because everybody knows the term multitasking, right? You probably all do it, which means you do a lot of different things, often at the same time. Um, and, but what, what the brain researchers are saying is that is a bad thing. What has happened as a result of that, we have lost the ability to focus and concentrate. So, and I, should, I see this um, a lot of times, again, for that training students. Um, I see them when they sit down to have a conversation with another person, 
they're not listening. They can't settle down enough to listen. They're thinking about the next thing they're going to say. So I really have to work with them really hard to say, listen. Don't talk. Listen and focus. And so the brain researchers say that's what we've gotten to with the multitasking. Um, and even with something um, as simple as we used to write letters and uh, used to even write emails, really. But now people tweet. Well, why do you tweet? Because you can do it in a few seconds and you can go to something else. Boom, 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 boom. But the brain is not designed for that. It's designed for focus and concentration. So if you're guilty of doing a lot of multitasking, you, will be, you are training your brain to hop from one thing to the next. But what we see here is focus is important in terms of how the brain functions. Um, so we need to be able to capture thoughts that are good that we want to think about. Bad thoughts, we need to let them go. Choices. Choices, choices about what you think. Um, that we can make a conscious decision about how we are going to think. Um, our perception of the environment plus how we manage our environment controls our bodies and lives. If you change your perception, you change your biology. Again, connection between mind and body. I'm going to move to uh, my final, uh, you see the babies. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So this is, this is backed up in so many different things. Um, they've done research with medical students. When they're studying a particular disease, they develop the symptoms. Because what you concentrate on and what you focus, <coughs> it happens within you. And so there's lots of research to back up everything I'm saying to you. Cellular memory, um, that, that we do capture things in our cell. Trauma is captured, has the potential to be captured in every cell of our body. Um, and therefore, when we engage in meditation and specific strategies to reduce stress and that kind of thing, it is very helpful for your whole body. All right, so I'm going to um, move. Uh, I want you to, a couple of things. This slide, I want to show you something. Um, this is some research, and these are people on that in that research study who indicated that they were healthy. Now, um, you see healthy in, in, in that? <laughs> Diabetes, hypertension, cancer, thyroid, arthritis, heart failure, uh, incontinence, hypertension, arthritis, strokes, uh, vascular disease. How could they think they were healthy? How? Because they choose to. They choose to. And that is something that helps us actually to feel good about ourselves. In older adults, um, one of the things they do is they change the standard of comparison. If they compare themselves to a 30-year-old, they would be looking really pretty bad, OK? But if they compare themselves to the 96-year-old who's in bed paralyzed, they're doing pretty good, OK? So the perception I show this to show you that how you think about it, again, becomes really important. This is the last slide. Um, this is an important uh, woman. She is a trauma expert. Um, so you've seen her? OK, all right. This is her, too. OK. So who is she? Her name is Tonya Kane. She was arrested 83 times. She was convicted 66. She went through 19 years of drug addiction, 19 years of living under a bridge. Um, she was an alcoholic. She lost custody of four children uh, because they were taken away. She was you know, a drug addict, a uh, crackhead. Um, and she, is, she was a consumer of mental health programs. She went through drug programs. She went through typical mental health services. Okay. Um, and so what happened? What happened? Well, her story is that, and because she was, she was being served by many mental health programs, um, because um, her story is that 
she went to an agency um, in Maryland, and it was trauma-informed. So I guess it was when they were just starting to do this, and this particular program was trauma-informed. And she walked into that agency, and she noticed that they were more respectful than usual. And then, when she sat down, the person that she talked to asked her, what has happened to you? She said it was the first time in her life anybody had asked her what had happened to her. And her story was, her mom uh, was a drug addict, but she often had men around, and she would always bring them home. There were nine kids, she was the oldest, um, and she said the men always ended up at the children's room, always. To protect her siblings, she went with the men. And so she was sexually abused. She says in her story, she says she doesn't know how many times she was raped, she didn't know how many times, whatever, including one of her probation counselors raped her. Just a horrible experience. But when she was asked, what has happened to you? And for the first time, she told someone what had happened to her as she tried to protect her, her sisters and brothers. And that began a healing process. And she obviously had to go through counseling, and she had a very skilled counselor who walked her through it. But she is nationally known, she speaks around the world, um, and I use it as an example is that, and she says it a lot too. She said when you come, when, when, when a client comes in to see you in any of these, the agency, and you look at their case file, look beyond what you see there on paper, um, because there's more there. So the seeds of resilience lie in each of us. Sometimes we have to go through the clutter to get to it. But that was her case. It wasn't that she, she didn't have the potential to be resilient. It was hidden under all 19 years of living under the bridge and all of the things that had happened to her. So this is why I say to you that there are horrible stories going on. And I often say that if we really believe what the research says, we would put every dollar we can into protecting children. Because failure to protect children means that they are at an increased risk throughout their whole life. So, but the, but the point I wanna make is that the seeds of resilience are in each of us. It doesn't matter what has happened in your life. You still can Bring, come back, you can adapt, you can succeed. Everything is there. So we have to learn to look beyond the things that happened in the past as an obstacle, an obstacle and to think about it differently. Did you learn something through that experience? Are you stronger because of that? You have to find that way of thinking about it. That is the think again message. Yes, it did happen but can you think about it differently? If you can, that will move you toward being able to use those, skill, those seeds of resilience, which is there. You can pop back, you can change your life. And so that is my message to you today, is one for each of us. I hear this message and I speak this message because I know it's true. And so if we each will start to think about and implement something as simple as think again, I think that our lives will change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Davis, for that presentation. Um, your um, your research and the stories that you shared, um, I think, are, are hugely valuable. Um, I, I appreciate the reminder that we all have choices um, and that 
are thinking can help us to develop resiliency and we can apply that to our life journeys. And uh, I know this as a peer uh, from personal experience that, that, that what Dr. Davis has presented is very, very true, that, that we, all have, we all have that ability to make, to make choices and, and to change and uh, apply that resilience in our lives. So thank you again, Dr. Davis. Can we have another round of applause, please? For Dr. Davis? So the next part of our program is the presentation of this year's Voice of Recovery Award. It was established in 2011, and it's uh, established in memory of a job coach, a colleague, and friend, uh, Jenny Vaughn Bates. And uh, she was a strong advocate, collaborator, and team member who was respectful to all and honest in her communications. So this award recognizes a mental health consumer, provider, or organization who embodies these qualities. So I'd like to invite Andrea Hayes from Community Services, Emergency Services, and CIT to the stage to present the award. statement because her advocacy for our folks in employment was just amazing. We shared a lot of choice words together <laughs> <laughs> at work and outside of work, so that's how our personal and professional friendship developed. So the reward actually is going to be to a, a person that worked, that works in a program where Jenny actually worked as well. So. So um, I have known this woman for, I don't know, a long time. Right? Right, Lynn? Um, <laughs> and uh, Prince William stole her from Alexandria CSB, and every time I go to Alexandria, they talk about how much they miss her, actually, still to this day. And we figured out today it's been 15, 14, 10? But it's been over 10. It's a double digit. So speaking of double digits, because I'm over 40, I can't possibly read this little thing that Cynthia gave me to read. So I have a much bigger thing to read, so, even with my glasses. So, um, Lynn Fritz has been working with the homeless population uh, through the PATH program for over 20 years. Through her work with PATH, Lynn outreaches homeless individuals and connects them to various services and benefits. She is engaged on a variety of committees and teams designed to connect services and supports in the people of the community. She provides leadership for the annual point in time count. Oh, don't you love that, Lynn? Um, and also participates <laughs> in the Permanent Supportive Housing Committee, the Community Outreach and Relationship Engagement Subcommittee, the Continuum of Care Committee, and many, many more. Most importantly, Lynn sets out every day to bring hope to those who have limited access to resources. Lynn is well known as one of the one who has completely and compassionately serves the homeless and individuals with mental illness. Over the course of her career, Lynn has patiently guided hundreds, patiently, hundreds of individuals through the process of obtaining benefits in addition to training others how to do so. Sorry, that part. Okay, Lynn, 
Lynn's is. Oh, is mine different than yours? Okay, so Lynn's impact is from, we're really not meaning to be the comedian. <laughs> but um, well, no, can't help ourselves. Jenny, we just had a talk to that Jenny is so smiling down on us right now. She's laughing right She's now. She's totally laughing. <laughs> so, in true Jenny spirit. So, Lynn's impact is far reaching and appreciated by many. Um, Lynn approaches her work with excellence and integrity, assuming that all individuals she encounters are treated with dignity and respect. And I 125% believe that and have been very fortunate to work with Lynn on many different cases, and she is my go-to person. So Lynn Fritz, come on down! Um, so I would like to um, welcome Carol Thacker from Community Services to the stage uh, for some closing remarks. We're so appreciative that you all came. All the support from the different vendors. Thank you, Dr. Davis. We've learned a lot about how to use what we already innately have and maybe enhance that, improve that, to be able to function well. 100, was it 116, 118, 114, can't imagine. So, before we um, leave, I want to make sure that you all know we have a gift certificate from the massage group. If you are in the middle section, row 11, so Cynthia, where is row 11? Wonderful, safe evening. Thank you all. Thank you.